Well, today we're continuing in week two of our new series called God Box, which is a series where we've been taking a look at prayer, specifically diving into to prayer, the power of prayer. And so if you're new here, um, you've come at a perfect time because we've just begun a church-wide challenge, a 30-day prayer challenge where we, have in, as an entire church, have begun praying together for one month, um, expecting God expecting God to do something fresh, something new in our lives. And we're believing that a praying church is actually a powerful church. And so based upon all the prayers that you guys wrote last week, I had the privilege of praying over those and just praying for each one of you. Um, I'm, I believe that there is no shortage, no shortage of things that we can be praying for, right? Like last week, some of you um, were praying for directions in your career. You were just praying, and actually this was a theme that many of you are like looking to God for uh, either the next step in your career or potentially what he has in store for a new career. Prayers for a stronger marriage. Man, I loved reading them. Not that there was a problem, but it was just, God, help me have a stronger marriage. Help our marriage to be more in line with you. Prayer for children and for family. And uh, there was one that I felt like, man, this is so, so honest, so true, right? They said, God, help limit my frustration with the craziness of work and home life when those two collide. Anybody relate to that, right? And then this one just, man, I've been praying for this one off and on as I remember it throughout the week. Somebody said, I want to pray for a friend who's struggling with addiction and depression. This, see, this is, there's so much around us, so many things in our lives, so many things in the lives of people that you know of, of ways that we could be praying for other people or things that we even need to pray for ourselves. So last week we gave everybody a, a box. We, ta- we called it our, our God box after uh, Mary Lou Quinlan wrote a book. And you can listen to uh, week one on our podcast or jump on our website to, to watch that and jump in and catch up to where we are. But we gave out all these boxes. And in fact, in just a few seconds, if you didn't get one, we're going to give you one of those today. But I want you to see my daughter Leah's God box. So Leah is our youngest. This is her box. She's decorated it. Lots of, of happy faces um, because those are stickers and those are easy to put on there. But this was her prayer. I hope Cooper doesn't puke, right? That's our dog. And, and so, like, I align with that prayer. I can say amen to that prayer over and over again. Um, and so, but that's what was on her heart. So, so beautiful. Last night, uh, while we were kind of doing the whole bedtime ritual and putting kids to bed, I talked to everybody in bed and, and then made my final swoop through to, like, make sure all the lights were off. And I walked in, and I see Grace on her bed, and uh, as I was ready to just be like, what's your light doing on? You know, the whole daddy type thing. And I see her, she's got her box on her lap, and she's writing a, a prayer. And I was like, oh, sweet angel, like, baby, um, you just take your time. You leave that light on as long as you want, girlfriend. And um, so it was, uh, it's, it's a fun thing. I hope you've been enjoying this series. I hope that you've been um, praying throughout the week. Um, this is actually, this is my God box. And so I decorated mine. I'm very simple, basically uh, one color. But this is my God box because I love to spearfish. So I love to dive. This is a dive flag. And symbolic for me, not only am I a diver, but this is, I want to dive deeper into prayer. You see what I did there? Yeah, yeah, see that? Tammy doesn't think that's funny. That's okay. Um, But I wanted to dive deeper into my prayer life, and so I decorated it this way. Um, Hopefully you guys have been making this your own. But I wanted to share with you just a few of the things that that I've put into mine. Um, One is this gigantic one, right? So actually, this isn't even real. I told you post-it notes. I broke the rules. We're going to go 11 by 17, baby, Um, because I am praying for Easter here at Hope City. I've begun praying for this already. In fact, we've got an event that we're going to be partnering. We're going to be merging this on Easter Sunday in an attempt to, to reach into our community. We believe that our church should be making a difference in our community, but also um, partnering with the gospel. And so we're going to be doing Sarasota Egg Drop partnered by Hope City Church, and I'm hoping that many of you will help volunteer on Easter Sunday to make this an incredible experience. 10,000 Easter eggs dropping from the sky, right? Like, what well, kids love that kind of stuff. I don't really get it, but um, they're going to love it, and families will, will be here, and they're going to, I believe, that decisions will be made on that day that will impact the rest of their life, and I've been praying for that. I've been putting this into my, my, my box um, right here, I also have High School Connect Group. We really believe that, that students are 
they are the next generation. They are this generation, and God is already working in this generation right now. And so I've been praying for our high school students here at Hope City and our middle school students. Um, even just this weekend, you know, for me, my, my sister and um, her husband, they're expecting a baby any day, and there's some complications that came up in the last few days. And so these are the types of things that I've been writing and just putting in, in my box because... Um, we mentioned last week that when we inhale a worry, we want to exhale a prayer. And the, the habit and the practice of writing them down forces us into the rhythm of not just letting it stay in our head, but also moving into a position and a place of prayer. And so, like I said, our series has been founded in this verse, Ephesians chapter 6, verse 18. After we've asked this question, we ask the question, where do you need God's power most in your life? Because here we see, and pray in the Spirit on all occasions, every occasion, the good, the bad, the ugly, with all kinds of prayers and requests. With this in mind, be alert and always keep on praying for the Lord's people. So for the next 30 days, we are cranking up the spiritual temperature of our church, of your prayer life, and we're flooding heaven with all kinds of prayers, all kinds of requests, not just for ourselves, but for the Lord's people as well. And so the challenge is simple, just like I said. Just write one to two prayers. You know, whatever you do, um, just write some of these prayers, date them, put them in your God box, because we want to look back after 30 days and see the great things that God has done. So you know what? Right now, I want to invite our ushers to come. If you guys didn't get one of these, we would love to give you one of these even right now. Just slip your hands up. Ushers, you guys can come forward. There's some people back there, some over here. Uh, If you could get them in their hands right now. Because we believe that doing this together makes all the difference in the world, which is why we have, you know, merged our connect groups at this time. There's some people right over here. We've merged our connect groups at this time because we are launching this as a prayer campaign. Joe, if you could get some over here. Because we want to pray with each other. We want to hold up each other's arms. And that that looks back at the passage that we talked about out of Exodus last week. And so get in a connect group. You need to be in a connect group with other people. It's not because we're looking to fill programming or create your schedule to be far busier than it already is. No, we believe that God does some amazing things when his people gather together in circles and they look across the room and develop relationships with people that may not even be just like you. So sign up for that today. At least talk to somebody afterwards. You're not signing your life away. You're not committing to anything. Um, And it's got easy on-ramps and easy off-ramps. So go ahead and join us. But this morning, today, I've got a message that, like, in the last 24 hours, it has just continued to burn inside of my heart. And I'm, I'm praying, I've been praying for you, for me, that this would, this would change the way that we view God and the way that we approach God. So pull out your notes today. We're going to be taking a look at Luke chapter 18, verses 1 through 8. And today, we want to see what Jesus taught about persistence in prayer. So if you want to open your Bibles, jump to Luke chapter 18. There's Bibles on the seats around you, or you can open up your um, version app on your smartphone or on the screens behind me. Uh, last week, we learned that prayer is a pipeline to God's power. But this week, we're going to see that a key to answered prayer for God's power, a key to God's power, lies with our persistence as well. And so my question today is, are you a persistent person? (laughs) Maybe you live with a persistent person, but the question is, are you a persistent person? Don't point at them right now. Don't do that. See, the word persistence is funny. Persistence is a funny word because it feels closely aligned with the word pester. And pester has this kind of negative um, undertone to it, or maybe not even undertone. Maybe it's just like, you get it. If you're a parent, you're like, yep, I don't want to be pestered. In fact, like that's super frustrating to me. But sometimes I think that's how we view prayer. That when we think of persistence in prayer, we actually view prayer as a bit of like a way of pestering God, that we're, we're sort of bothering God because, man, isn't he the, the God of the universe? He's so busy, but he would have time to listen to me, to hear me, the, these small, seemingly small things that I'm coming before God with? You know, maybe you felt that way. Maybe you have like, you've been praying the same thing over and over again, and you get the feeling that God just must be sick of me. 
Like sometimes we'll come to God over and over again with a stubborn situation in our lives. And when we don't see progress, we jump off of that, that rhythm and we're like, well, I guess that means God's not willing. Or maybe he's just ignoring me. Or worse yet, maybe he's sick of hearing my problems. See, Jesus addresses this very issue with his disciples in Luke chapter 18. And I want us to to read this and to dive into this this morning. So Luke chapter 18, verse 1, it says this. Then Jesus told his disciples a parable or a story to help illustrate a truth. That's what a parable is. It's a story that, that illustrates a truth. And he says to show them that they should always pray and not give up. He says this. This is the story. In a certain town, there was a judge who neither feared God nor cared what people thought. (laughs) Interesting fellow. And there was a widow in that same town who kept coming to him with a plea. Grant me justice against my adversary. You know, for some time he refused. But finally he said to himself, even though I don't fear God or care what people think, yet because this widow keeps bothering me, I'll see that she gets justice so that she won't eventually come and attack me. And the Lord said, listen to what the unjust judge says. And will not God bring about justice for his chosen ones who cry out to him day and night? Will he keep putting them off? I tell you, he will see that they get justice and quickly. However, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on earth? See, it's a fascinating story. This is a very, very interesting story because it teaches us something about our Heavenly Father. In fact, it it teaches us that God is not put off when his children pester him. Rather, and this is our first point today, that God is moved by persistence. That God is moved by your persistence in prayer. See, think about this woman. This, This parable is often called the parable of the persistent widow or the story about the persistent widow. See, widows and orphans in Jesus' day and age, they were among the most vulnerable and, uh, and easy targets for that culture. And they were, they were God's people. God had this special place in his heart for, for widows and orphans. Throughout scripture, you find that theme all over the place. And in Jesus' day, a widow typically had um, you know, a, no education, typically had no job, no money, and no property, which meant that she had no status and no power. And her survival was linked to whether or not she had a brother, whether or not she had a son or a brother-in-law, or quite possibly even a father who would then re- like s- allow her to come back into their home, and she would fall underneath of the care of that individual. And if not, she was basically destined to live life as a beggar. She was out on the streets, what you and I would call a, a, a modern-day homeless person. That's what the, the, the culture of the widows were, and a social outcast without the protection of others. Which is why scripture says that God is especially sensitive to the needs of those who cry out, those who who lack the biological family, just like this woman did. She was powerless and penniless. She had nothing to her name. Which is why she goes to a local magistrate, a local judge with this request. The request was simple. She said, grant me justice against my adversary. Somebody step in. Help me out where where things are going, you know, kind of off the rails. In other words... She was asking for care and protection. Who's going to look out for me? That kind of a thing. So we don't know like, what the background of the story is. We don't know if she's being harassed, if she's being cheated, if she's being swindled. You know, oftentimes, um, widows are easy marks for swindlers. And so she had a need, some sort of need, something that was, was bothering her. And she would pray. She was talking to this judge, and she said, Grant me justice. Somebody stand up for me. Will somebody step in? And guys, I don't know what that could be for you. I don't know what in the world you're crying out to or to God to care for and say somebody else have a concern about this. But there was one problem. The judge, the judge was described as a man that neither feared God nor cared what people thought. So this guy was like kind of doing his own thing. He didn't respect God. He didn't respect God's word, his wisdom, or even divine justice, the sense of like what right and wrong is. 
Maybe this guy is overworked. Maybe he had a huge caseload. We have no idea what was going on, but we do know one thing. We know that he really didn't care about the social outcast. He didn't care about people the way that God has, has encouraged us to care about others. He had no consideration for this poor widow who was begging for his protection. Because in verse 5, he put it this way. It says, yet because this widow keeps bothering me, I'll see that she gets justice so that she won't attack me, right? Like you get this sense of like this woman is badgering him so much that, that he's like, I don't know what she's going to do next. Like I'm, she's thinking like, I'm just going to knock on his door all the time. I'm going to be that persistent like knock, knock, knock. Help me, help me. He goes out to like the grocery store and there she is like pushing his cart. Help me. And he like goes and gets something out of the freezer section and she's behind the door. Help me. You know, like consistently everywhere this woman goes and where the judge goes, the woman's there too begging him for justice, begging him for care, for concern. <laughs> and uh, the judge ignored her for a while. The New Living Translation is great. Check this out. It says, the judge ignored her for a while, but finally said to himself, I don't fear God or care about people, but this woman's driving me crazy. I'm going to see that she gets justice because she's wearing me out with her constant requests. Some of you are like, wait, she's not a widow. That's my wife, right? Like, I get it, right? You know, okay, easy women, relax. Um, I'm on your side. Um, but I had a situation at home with Tiffany recently that, you know, it didn't quite fall into, like, the persistent pestering uh, widow. But uh, two months ago, our clothes dryer decided to act up. And so it would kick on, and it would turn on for about three minutes, never really get hot, and then turn off. It was the weirdest thing, right? And so it did this over and over again. It would start turning, and then it, it wouldn't it wouldn't run anymore. And then, like, so she told me about it, and I was like, yeah, yeah, I'll take care of it. I'll fix it. No big deal. Well, then, like, two weeks after that, she says, now, like, when you press start, nothing actually happens. Well, I learned, you know, I, I've had uh, all kinds of car problems in the past, and I've learned that there's, there's workarounds to everything, right? So I learned that you could open the door, you could put your finger on the little door switch, and you could press start, and then, like, jump start the dryer. So you could actually like pop the clutch to the dryer and it would start and it would stay running. And then if you took your finger off that switch, you had to slam the door quick so it would keep running. And every now and then like a sock would find its way out as it, you started through the jump start. So I taught her how to jump start our dryer. And, and we went progressively for about another month of jump starting our dryer anytime we needed to wash clothes. But apparently, like, that's not a solution. That's not a fix. I, I don't know that I totally agree with that. And so we kept pushing it, kept pushing it. She's sitting on the couch one night. She's like, uh, it's not working. I'm like, oh, just you wait. Watch this. Got magic fingers right here. Thumb on the switch. Jump start. Push start. Nothing. Jump start. Jump start. Over and over again. Nothing. Like, this thing quits on me, right? And so I'm like, oh, man, this is so frustrating. And uh, she kept saying, like, listen, um, we have no way of drying these clothes, which means that you have to fix this now. And so I started doing, like, the math. I opened the underwear drawer, and I'm like, okay, I got boxers for about, uh uh-huh. I can put this off for about four more days, right? And she's like, you got to get this done. Got to get it done. Got to get it done. And the other night, finally, her persistence, I decided to just tear the dryer apart and figure it all out, replace the motor, and it works perfectly. You want to know what the funniest thing is? I've had the motor for about a month and a half. <laughs> it's been sitting in the garage. But, man, you could jumpstart that baby and it would work. But this is what happened with the widow in Luke 18. She kept pestering the stingy judge. In this case, the stingy husband. And even though he wasn't willing, her badgering bent, bent his will. Her badgering just pushed him to the place where he was like, fine, whatever it takes, you got it. I'll give it to you. And I told you last week that I wanted to help you increase your prayer life, which is why we handed out these boxes. This is nothing magical. There's nothing special. In fact, to some of you, this appears elementary. Speaking of elementary, we're doing this across the entire church. All of your kids will be getting one of these today if they didn't get one last week. Because we want to do this, even, teach even our youngest kids that they can draw a picture and that the Holy Spirit can interpret what's going on in their heart through their picture, that God cares about 
your concerns, your kids' concerns, and the deepest thoughts and, and fears in my heart. And so I want to help you grow in your prayer life. And one of the things I want to do to help you do that is I want to text you a daily prayer prompt. I'm not going to spam you. I'm not going to, you know, drag this off into, I'm not going to sell your number. Although that's not a bad idea. But um, I want to invite you to take out your, your cell phone and text the word prayer in the message to the address 797-979. Has this been helpful to you guys? I hope that it's been one of those things that when you see it in the morning, 845, I'm not going to wake you up. Um, at 845, there's going to be a, a prayer prompt for you. And it's just, uh, it's less than 160 characters. It's something to say, hey, would you think about this? Would you consider praying about this? And just leave it in your lap as a way of helping to remind you to pray, helping to remind you to come before God. See, we, I'm convinced that we need to grow in our persistence in our prayer life. That we need to, to grow in the abilities that we have to not give up. You and I know without a shadow of a doubt, you could fill this box today. If I gave you a stack of index cards, I, I promise you that with the right amount of time, you could fill them all. We have no lack of things to pray for. But yet we get off the rail somewhere because we just stop praying. And Jesus is, is teaching us that we need to be persistent. So what do you need to ask God for? But maybe you're too afraid to keep asking. Maybe it feels just too big. Or maybe it feels like you've just been bothering God. That Jesus just doesn't want to hear from you anymore. But I want to invite you to flip back to Luke chapter 11 because Jesus told a similar story about a guy who tried to borrow some, some bread from his next door neighbor. So I want to summarize the story for you and then we want to jump in into this one, one specific verse. So the story is this, this guy, another parable, he, he wants to borrow some bread from his neighbor. Who knows why? It's in the middle of the night and he goes over to his neighbor's house and he's knocking on the door, right? And the guy comes out, he's like, probably rubs his eyes. He's like, what are you doing? He's like, I need to borrow some bread. Bro, you know what time it is? It's like 11 p.m. No, I need bread now. Go away. You're going to wake the kids up. Guy goes away. Comes back and he's like, I need to borrow some bread. Give me some bread. And he's like, what is wrong with you? And he sends him away. Comes back again, knocking. This time louder, more persistent. And he's like, let me borrow some bread. And Jesus tells the story that the guy then gives him bread just to Send him on his way so that he stops knocking. In verse 9, key verse, it says, So I say to you, Jesus says to his disciples, to anybody that's listening, to us this morning, so I say to you, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened to you. Ask is an incredible acronym. A-S-K, ask is, is a way for us to remember uh, that what we should be doing in prayer. We should ask, make the request. Just come before God, make that request. To seek is to really press in, to look for God, knock. And it's that idea of like, if you don't get an answer, just keep knocking, try again. But the problem with both of these parables is it can be confusing because you hear these stories and you assume, all right, so I get it. So I'm, I'm the guy, the crazy guy knocking on the door in the middle of the night, or I'm the, the lady that's pestering the judge because these are parables about prayer. And prayer is trying to get something from God, right? It's that like bringing your desires before God. And so the problem with prayer is that for a lot of Christians, they misinterpret what Jesus is saying. They read these types of things or they hear these things and they say, okay, so obviously I'm the widow and that makes God who? the unjust judge, right? Well, God is this ill-tempered, you know, kind of tight-fisted tyrant, this, this husband that won't fix the dryer. He's got a universe to run, and he isn't really interested in our seemingly inconsequential requests. But that's not who God is. I mean, like, that's not who, who God says he is. That's not his nature. Guys, I don't want you to miss this. Luke says that the judge neither feared God nor cared about people, which is exactly the opposite of the heart of the Father. It's the opposite of God's character. 
See, Jesus is getting at something very specific for us in Luke 11. He says, ask, seek, and knock. And when he says this, he goes on in verse 11 to say this. Which of you fathers, if your son asks for a fish, will give him a snake instead? Or if he asks for an egg, will give him a scorpion? If you then, though you are evil or imperfect, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? See, one of the things that we learned today about prayer is that God is not an unjust God. He's not an unjust judge, but he's your generous father. See, this is our second point this morning, that God is a generous father, and he loves to give his children good gifts. So let me ask you, do you relate to God more as as a judge, a tight-fisted judge, or an open-handed father? See, the word that Jesus uses for father here in this text is, is Aramaic, it's, it's Abba. Abba, not the band, but Abba, which means Papa. In our language, it's best translated as, as Daddy. That's, that's the best way to translate how Jesus refers to God. Abba is this very tender and like emotional, and it's this way of referring to, to your dad in the, in the most endearing sense, very childlike nature. And Jesus' Jewish audience, the people that were hearing this for the first time, they would have been scandalized by hearing Jesus say this, your daddy in heaven. See, to refer to the sovereign Lord of the universe by the name daddy was unprecedented. Nobody did that. In fact, Jewish people, even to this day, they won't spell the word God, G-O-D. They'll they'll leave out the O and just kind of put a space in between or a dash out of reverence for God because they don't want to be too comfortable where they can even come before him and say his name. They put space, they put distance between his name and, and them. And here's Jesus saying, our father, our Abba, our Papa or Daddy who's in heaven. When you pray, who are you talking to? When you pray, who do you, who do you talk to? See, to begin with, he's your daddy. There's this picture here of, of my daughter, Leah. Um, this was a couple months ago. I was laying on our carpet in our family room and just kind of spread out that day. And, and I was probably on my phone, probably on Facebook or something, something inconsequential. And Leah comes running in, and she, like, jumps on my back. And she kind of puts her knees in all the right spaces. And, and so I'm squirming, and she's loving it. She's just squealing with delight. And she sees my phone's out, and so she clicks the camera, flips it around, and she's like the selfie queen in our house. And so she starts snapping all these pictures of her and I. And I got to tell you that in that moment, it wouldn't have mattered what I was doing. Her joy, her laughter was so contagious. It was so... Man, it was just bubbling over in her that it just made my, the heart of her as being her dad, her earthly father, just overwhelmed with joy. And this is the way that God sees you. God sees you as as his son, as his daughter. And God feels this way about you. He loves to hear his daughter's voice and cares deeply about her needs as he does his son's needs. Think about that. Because of your faith in Christ, the Bible says that your debt has been paid. In fact, you've been adopted into the family of God. You're no longer a widow. You're no longer an orphan. You're no longer without a family. Rather, your daddy, the creator of the universe, the the Lord, the master, he wants his children to have all the same rights as privileges of heaven. And you're free to enter into the throne room of heaven in Abba's presence and in his power. These next pictures I want to show you were taken um, over 50 years ago now. Now you'll recognize that this is JFK, the president of, of the United States, the leader of the free world, the most, one of the most powerful men in the world, arguably, because of his title, because of his position. But down here, this is John John. This is JFK Jr. And he's playing underneath of his dad's desk. And in fact, he, he loved to be at the feet of his dad as a little boy. He's peeking through the desks. And in fact, historians will tell us that JFK Jr. referred to this space under his dad's desk as home. There's another picture I want to show you. Same picture, different day. This happened on more than one occasion that John John or JFK Jr. was so comfortable being in the presence of his dad's feet that he called it home. 
to other people, they'd have to have a meeting. They'd have to schedule something. They'd, they'd walk into this office and they would say, sir or Mr. President. But in bursts this little boy who's comfortable to just get snuggled down by his dad's feet underneath of his desk and to the degree that he would call it home. Guys, in many ways, this is a reflection of the privilege that you and I have in prayer. As an adopted child of the Lord of the universe, you and I have the full rights, the full privileges of coming into the presence of God and taking hold of his love and his strength. The most powerful person in the entire universe. In fact, one of the ways that that theologians define God is that which is greater than anything your mind can ever comprehend or imagine. God can be defined as that which is greater than your mind can even think. And you and I get to go and sit at his feet and call that space home. We have the privilege of just being in God's presence. And we get to call him Daddy. And when you bring your request before Daddy, he's moved by these See, some of your dads, some of the dads in the room, you, you may naturally get this, you understand this, um, but for, you know, this past Monday night, I had this experience. Um, on Monday, I was uh, coerced, maybe even conned by our worship leader, Matt Light, to come to his house and to uh, help him jet in a well. So this is us, we're, we're working hard on jetting in this well. That's Josh, he was on keys today, and Matt, of course, he had to show us up being the young stud he is with no shirt on. I'm still upset about that. But uh, this is me. Either I'm the really smart guy or the really stupid guy. We'll let that kind of hang out there. But I'm the guy up on the ladder, standing on the balls of my feet for about, oh, six hours, right? And um, pushing on this massive pipe, trying to send it way into the earth just so this guy can get free water, right? Just pay for it like the rest of us, okay? Like, what's the deal with this? This is the dumbest, the, the dumbest thing that I've ever done. Because at the end of the day, it didn't even work. Sorry, Paige, I don't mean to like rub it in. But it didn't work. And so I get home Monday night. I'm exhausted. I'm wet, not nearly as wet as these clowns, but I'm, I'm like soaked and kind of got this like feeling of total paralysis. <laughs> I'm like waiting for death to just take over, and I would have felt better. And so laying on the couch, I look at Tiffany. I'm like, I am just, I am whooped. Like I am beat. And finally it came to me that like, There was a point in time when I was stretched across two ladders, standing, holding this PVC pipe, thrusting it down into the ground. And then I figured out, yeah, I was trying not to die the entire day. So I'm like working my core. It's still sore. So anyway, Noah walks into the room and he's got like all this energy, whereas I have like got none of that energy. He comes in the room. He's like, hey, dad, let's go play football. And I'm like, no. He walks out. He comes back in. He's like, hey, dad. Let's go play football. No. He comes in a third time, this time with the ball. He's like, Dad, I got the ball. And I'm like, no. Like, I I really can't, but I'm sorry, I can't. Well, then I had this thought, oh, no. I know what Monday night is. Anybody else know what Monday night is? It's trash night with recycling. And so I thought, how am I going to get all this stuff out to the curb? That's why we had kids. So I'm like, hey, Noah, I need you to help me move the cans to the curb and the recycling. Wouldn't you know it, this guy, he's carrying like two trash cans, recycling cans, and a football tucked underneath of his arm. And so as I'm carrying out like one of the trash cans, all of a sudden I hear in the background, it's like, hey, dad, and the football is flying at me. And I'm like, catch it. Of course I have to catch it. It's just a reflex. And he's like, let's have a catch. He got me outside with the ball coming at me. And so now what do I do? Because of his persistence, he moved the father's heart in me to have, catch, to have a catch with a football. We spent the next 30 minutes out there just throwing the football back and forth with one rule. I wasn't going to move. Like <laughs> You had to get it right to me. But here's the deal. Like I don't want you guys to miss out on this. What moved me to action? Persistence. Persistence moved me to action. It was that, that willingness that he had to keep bugging me and bugging me and bugging me until the point where you finally think, you know what, this is just such an unreasonable request, but to help him just calm down and quiet down, I'm going to do it. And Jesus says this, which of you fathers, if your son asks for a fish, will give him a snake instead? No, no dad in this room would ever do that. You never give your son a scorpion instead of an egg. 
And if we're imperfect fathers, and God is a perfect father, how much better will he do? How much more generous will he be? Guys, I'm flawed, but it took my son's persistence to move me. And I did it out of affection, not annoyance. When I walked back in after 30 minutes, I I felt so good to hobble into the house after tossing the ball back and forth. Because he was overjoyed. It was like his heart was full to capacity. And this is what Jesus is saying. He's saying, if you earthly broken dads do this for your kids, how much more does your heavenly father who's perfect delight in answering your prayers? So ask, seek, knock. And notice that, that each word gets a little more intense. Ask. It's, it's just that simple request. It's that, that desire to, to ask God for, I need this, Dad. Seek. It's stronger. It's that sense of like, I'm searching for it. I'm looking. I'm committed to laying hold of what you have for me. And knock is the most intense. It's that, I'm not going away, Dad. Dad, let's have a catch. Dad, I've got the football. Dad, catch this. Keep knocking. Don't give up. Keep seeking. Keep searching for God's heart because he is moved because you're a treasured son and daughter of God. Jesus teaches us that we should, in prayer, be bold and persistent. That you should be bold and persistent in your prayers. That the things that are on your hearts, the things that are on your minds, don't let it go. God gave you your emotions. Like, who do you think created that? God did. And he wants to hear what's on your heart. Why don't you ask more? Why don't I ask more? In this last week, I've been challenged to not let go, but to keep praying over and over and over again about the things that God's put on my heart for the city of Sarasota. For this Easter here at Hope City, I believe that God wants to do some amazing things. In fact, I believe that stranger things are going to happen. God is pressing in on me. And I believe that he's pressing in on you too. That there's someone in this room right now that God's saying, don't stop asking. Don't give up. Don't just walk away from this too easily. Because listen, your Abba loves you. Your daddy loves you. Your father in heaven loves you. And I know not everybody in the room had a perfect dad. And some of you, your perspective on God has been tainted because of your earthly father. But I don't know what you're struggling with. I don't know what's in your God box. You know, maybe it's infertility or a difficult marriage. Or maybe it's a career that needs changing. You need to set your requests before God with renewed passion, with renewed strength this morning. And what would happen if you leaned in with a bold request and touched the Father's heart like never before? Guys, don't give up. As the sons and daughters of God, we have every privilege to come before the throne room of God and to touch the Father's heart Keep knocking. Your heavenly Father longs to hear from you.